Chosen Men. Kind of. We're not actually going to be playing Chosen Men. I'm showing this to you because we're kind of getting ready to play Chosen Men. Don't go anywhere. We're doing some miniature war game stuff that is really fascinating. It's a bit of a holy grail for me, the kind of thing I've wanted to do for a long time. Tried to do this earlier in the year, and it didn't work out very well at all because I kind of bit off more than I could chew. What you're looking at is a map-based campaign. Come with me on a journey of discovery as we explore the style of campaign that, to my knowledge, was first popularized by Tony Bath and Donald Featherstone, leading luminaries of miniature wargaming. And if you look at Featherstone's, uh, I think it's wargame campaigns, and Tony Bath's ancient war games. That's where I've stolen a lot of these concepts from. It's taken almost whole cloth from Featherstone. In most warfare, if you're engaged in a fair fight, you did something wrong. In most miniature war games, they are designed to have a fair fight. Chosen Men recommends 300 point by battles. So you've got 300 points versus 300 points on a neutral battlefield that doesn't favor one side or the other. We all know that doesn't happen in wars. If it does, you screwed up. On the other hand, this is largely a social activity, and nobody wants to go in and play the side of the Texans on the Alamo. Well, I mean, I kind of do, but even if you know the battle is going to be lost, you'd like to know that you can win the game. So in the Alamo that I played, we had the opportunity to win by lasting longer than the defenders of the actual Alamo, or by killing more Mexicans who assaulted, than the, and we actually lost the game as well. We, we did worse than the actual Alamo defenders. Not that I'm complaining. Bunch of heroes, those. The point is, how do you bridge that gap? How do you have not fair fights, or at least open the door for the possibility for unfair fights? How do you incorporate things that most war games struggle at? The fog of war, of war, asymmetric forces. All of these things get encapsulated in the map-based campaign. More to the point, it's a style of campaign that changes your decision-making process because you have to worry more about tomorrow and what happens after the game is over. So I've been looking to do this for a good long time, and I'm very excited to show you the campaign that I have set up. This is the Five Villages region, and I consider this to be a semi-solo campaign because what I did is I this, this setting behind this is that the French are on campaign, and they are trying to live off the land. It turns out this, and I didn't know this at the time, but it turns out this is somewhere on the Iberian Peninsula. So we're doing the Peninsula campaign. But before, those of you that have been with the channel for a while, you'll remember when, when we did the first Elopation War and the second Elopation War, and we built a whole big map, two nations, and we sprinkled forces, and then we mobilized them, we threw them at each other, and we had a good time. We generated some interesting battles for 2 by 2 Napoleonics. This is a much larger scale battle. And I, I say that the map scale. You geography nerds know what I'm talking about. In the vernacular, it's a smaller scale conflict. This is one county, maybe not even that. You've got a total of five villages, and the French are located off to the north. The main body of the troops are located up there somewhere. And the French forces have been tasked with coming down here, foraging for supplies, and getting them back to the north, to the main body of the enemy, of the, of the French army. The British are coming from the south, and their job is to stop them. Wellington engaged in something of a, a war of, what, do you, what would you call that, war of attrition, total war. He tried to deny the French supplies in some phases of the Iberian campaign, and it worked to a large extent. So this is a what we think of typically as a smaller scale engagement because it's not large armies pushing back and forth. It's just small units of foragers going down, beating up the locals and running off with the grain. And small force, you don't want to dedicate your whole main body because to stopping them as the British because the French are so widely dispersed. The best you can do, send a few guys out, slow them down, do what you can. Okay. So that's the overall setting. And then just to kind of walk you through the map, I think you can see it okay. It looks great on my phone. Hopefully it looks great on the YouTubes too. But we can, maybe we'll go ahead and, I'm going to try to zoom in just a little bit more here. There we go. So what do we have here? We've got our five villages. Beckerville, Hopeton, Tantrum on the Green, Melly, and Young Crossing. The names for all of these features are taken from 
internet friends. Whoever, whenever I do one of these, I look at the last series of commenters and I just start taking names off the top. So those five villages are where the largest vic- amount of victory points are. The French are going to have to run down its two points at Beckerville, Young Crossing, and Melly, and then three points at Hopeton and Tantrum on the Green. They show up, they spend one turn looting, and that will generate, in this case, two wagons that have to get sent to the north. As you can see, we've got a concentration of victory points here. If I think there's 17 victory points altogether. So we have two, four, six... 12 points in the villages, and then we have, I want to say, five farms. We've got Vlad Farm, James Farm, Hethwell Farm, Beasley Farm, and Yojimbo Farm. So there's our five. 17 points altogether. If the French can get nine of those points off the board, they win. Minor victory. If they can get, I can't remember what it is, but it's like if they can get 14 or 15 points, total victory for them. Likewise, if the British can prevent them from securing a majority of the points, it's a slight, I, th- I think there might be like a three-way, like a three-point swing where it's just a tie. If they get 10, 11, or like they, it's 8, 9, or 10, then it's a tie. At any rate, that's the goal for the French. So now we've got a goal that's beyond just line them up and throw the forces at each other. From there, I think the next thing we should look at is we got a couple of other map features that are worth talking about. We've got a stream that is uncrossable here, except at the fords. We've got a ford here, here, and here. And then we've also got Orange Chicken Bridge, named after one of our commenters. Those are the only places to cross this stream that cuts the battlefield in half. We've got two smaller streams here and here that you move up. You have to spend an entire map turn crossing that stream, and then you can continue as... as necessary. But we do have a ford here for this northern stream. We have a ford here for this southern stream. And they I can't remember what the names are off the top of my head, but I gave those streams names as well. And then, of course, Scar Bridge is the other way to, f- to cross this southern stream. The number of trees you see here indicates how many trees, how thick the woods are. And then we've got a couple of the little spider-looking things are hills. And then these little tufts of grass are actually swamps. This amounts to a tabletop that is 30 feet across by, I want to say it's 12 feet deep. Each one of these squares is one foot of table space, meaning that any grid of three by three squares is one table for me. As we move our forces around the map, if they get within six squares of each other, they will notice each other and the commanders will have to implement their orders. That might mean running away, or it might be engaging, depending on how those orders are written. All right, so remember that our two players now have a number of detachments of units that they give orders to. I want you guys to drive south and steal this and then get back. Or I want you to go get the supplies of Beckerville, get them home. Hey, two points. Or maybe go beat up the enemy, because this is where we get into the strategy aspect, right? Is your strategy to drive off the defenders first and then leisurely take your time getting the supplies back? Or do you grab the supplies and run? That's the challenge that the French have. The features you see on the map where you see two trees, like this square right here has two trees in it. So this foot of table, if there's a battle fought that includes this, I'm going to put down two tree features. Up here, oh, you know what? This, if they fight in the wrong place in these woods, I might have too many. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight farm trees all together. That's going to be really wooded. Likewise, if there's a road running through, a stream, a bridge, you know, the number of, of houses here show kind of what the village is going to look like. So we may have battles on the edge of a village. It's possible. I don't know where their forces are coming in. You could send all of your detachments on this side thinking, well, I'm just going to go sweep this whole area. You might send one detachment to, to hold the bridge. Right? That, I don't know. So that's what we're going to go over here in just a little bit. Bear with me as we go over the forces that are assigned to each of these two armies, the French and the British. And then we'll actually put markers down so we can start running the numbers to see how those forces interact. But before we get to that, like I said, let's take a look at the armies. We're going to start by going over the two detachments of the British. And remember, these rosters are suitable for use with chosen men. 
I didn't balance these uh, by points. I just balanced them by feel. I said, look, I'm going to give a few more points to the French because they have a lot more territory to cover. But otherwise, I try to just keep it balanced. You got a cavalry, you got a cavalry. That kind of thing, okay? So I gave the British two detachments. Detachment Lion and Detachment Unicorn. And I appointed Colonel Carter to Detachment Lion and Lieutenant Colonel Stallworth to Detachment Unicorn. Now, Detachment Lion has a unit of Lion Infantry and a unit of Dragoons. That's it. Captain Birdwhistle is commanding the Lion Infantry. There's basically ten of those guys. And then the Dragoons have four Dragoons, a Sergeant, and a Standard Bearer. So there's Detachment Lion. Then we've got Captain Bailey Dixon, we've got a line infantry and a unit of hussars for Detachment Unicorn. Captain Bert Bailey Dixon is commanding the line infantry. Captain Dankworth is commanding the hussars. Easy peasy. Then I said, look, to General, what am I calling him? General um, Urban. General Urban, you have these additional units. You've got a unit of rifles a captain and eight infantry, a unit of line infantry, and one light cannon. And you can assign these to either one of these detachments. And he said, but what if I want a third detachment? All right, fine. I'm going to assign you another lieutenant colonel, but he doesn't get any special abilities. So now he's got a third detachment that he can go out and find where those dirty French are. Bear in mind, Lieutenant Colonel Stallworth... He is a, an officer on foot, and he has, for king and country, he automatically rallies any broken units within six inches. This tells us a little bit about him. He's fiercely patriotic, which tells me he's going to stick to the letter of his orders as much as possible. Colonel Carter over here, he is the primary commander. He has lay of the land. Oh, he's a local. He knows a little something about this. Oh, good. Okay, so that means, now, in terms of the tabletop, he can move a piece of terrain. So if we wind up fighting over here, these woods in the hill, he may say, hey, you know what? That hill is actually 12 inches north. If he does, it's going to make my life complicated because I'll have to erase the hill and actually move it 12 inches north. I'm only going to allow him to do that once for each piece of terrain. Once he moves a piece of terrain, if he fights another battle here, he's not going to get to move that hill again. Once you see something on the tabletop, it's like etched in stone. The map is not the territory, but once you play it on the tabletop, we've declared where it is. So Colonel Carter, and that tells me that's why Colonel Carter was assigned to this, because he knows and is familiar with this territory. So he's the overall commander. And if he's something untoward should happen to him, then, you know, I think probably Lieutenant Colonel Second Fiddle will take over. Now, he's a foot officer, and he's commanding these rifles, line infantry, and the light cannon. Bear in mind, movement rates for these guys are going to be, if you got a cannon or supplies, you move one square per turn. If you have foot, you move two squares per turn. And if all you got is cavalry, you can move three squares per turn. Right? But I'm going to move these guys. Generally, they're going to be in a nine, a three by three area. Which table are they on? If, honestly, if it was me, I wouldn't have done this. I would have assigned all of these guys to Colonel Carter and I would have had one giant hammer sweeping through here, finding the enemy, and just crushing them one at a time. That's just me. And that's why I like this semi-solo wargaming. I'm already surprised because a guy's doing something that I think is kind of dumb. Now, bear in mind, when I say things like that, I have no ego. I fully admit I could be proven wrong. It happened one time. It was devastating. I got over it. Now let's take a look at the French forces, right? The French, I did the same thing, except this time I said, hey, you know what? I'm going to give you a detachment rouge, a detachment blue, and a detachment white. And in much the similar manner with the British, I said, one of them's got a cavalry and an infantry, one of them's got a cavalry and an infantry, and one of them's got two infantry, and then here's a couple of other units you can attach to whoever you want. The player immediately said... Yeah, that's dumb. I'm putting all my cavalry into Detachment Blue. Now, I, I didn't tell him he couldn't do that. And I said, all right. Now, I don't have enough. I'll be honest with you guys. I don't have enough figures to field 12 cavalry for the French. Some of these tabletops might look a little wonky because I don't have the figures for it. 
We'll get by. We'll make it work. Very, you know, Kobayashi Maru moment here, right? I told him. I was like, I didn't tell you you couldn't, so I'm going to let you do it, but you're killing me. And he, General Lean is what we're going to call him. No, General Elan. Yeah, Elan is a better anagram for his name. General Elan, he said, uh, hey, if you're doing one of these simulations and you're not breaking it, you're not trying hard enough. Yeah, you're going to see a lot of that out of General Elan, by the way. So he has... Lieutenant Colonel Locataire, and I probably would have assigned them. Oh, no, he couldn't do that. So General Lieutenant Colonel Locataire is a cavalry officer. So his cavalry, one of these units gets to move an additional... If he's attached to the unit on the tabletop, they can move two inches further per turn. Bear in mind, as a cavalry officer, I'm going to take that into my considerations when it comes to figuring out how he interprets his orders. He's a horse boy. He wants to go fast. Okay. Locataire, got to go fast. But he's got uh, hussars and um, lancers under his command. And we'll talk about what those orders are in a minute when we move back to the, to the map. So that's Detachment Blue is all horses. Then he was left with Detachment Rouge, which is just two line infantry units. Although it's worth pointing out that Lieutenant Colonel Moore is inspirational. His command radius, he gives people a morale bonus if they're within 12 inches of him instead of just within six, like all the rest of these guys. Uh, what do we got here? Eight infantry, eight infantry. Now, this unit here also has a sapper, which doesn't mean a whole lot in the ten terms of the map. Maybe it does. Maybe if the French decide to dynamite a bridge, having the sapper there will allow them to do that. I haven't figured it out yet. They're going to be throwing a lot more surprises at me. Come along with me for the journey, and we'll discover together. Uh, but as far as the tabletop is concerned, having a sapper in your unit, it costs extra points. He is a beast in melee. Right? Not only does he get D3 attacks instead of just the one, he's attacking on fives instead of threes like the rest of his dopes. He's got two wounds, so he's a beast. Also, you can dig in at the cost of one action point, or one tack, as they say, which is huge. These guys are going to be a defensive juggernaut. If they're used that way, we'll have to look at the orders and figure that out. Then we have Detachment. We talked about Detachment Horsey Blue and then Detachment White. He said, you know what? Put all of my... He did what I would have done. Put all of my extra units into a single detachment. So this is a big detachment. Colonel Linolock. You've heard that name before. I use it all the time in my... Uh, um, in these battle reports, he is bloodthirsty. Oh, that's good to know. Now, one of the things that I didn't tell the player is that Colonel Linolock, he pulled the, um, I, I'm a, the, excuse me, General Elan ordered Colonel Linolock to combine all of his horses into a single detachment. Colonel Linolock doesn't like that. And that's not just because I don't like it as the GM because it makes my life complicated. I actually embrace challenges like that. Uh, now, what do we know about Colonel Linolock? He is a mounted officer. He is bloodthirsty. So he has to pursue. If, he w if his unit wins a melee, he's got to pursue the enemy. No question about it. But he does get an extra D3 inches on his charge roll. Oh, he's a bloodthirsty guy, so he's mad. And there's a very good chance that if... Oh, sorry for the bump. If... Lieutenant Colonel Locataire gets into trouble with his horses. Colonel Lino Locke might drag his feet. Hey, you took my you took my support. Good luck, buddy boy. Might not come to that. But if it does, that's one of the ways that we interpret what the game has given us. Under his direct command, he's got the regular infantry. One unit of regular infantry. It's about 10 guys, standard bearer drummer. Another unit of regular infantry. Again, 10 guys, standard bearer drummer. Then he attached a light infantry, which is just five guys. Well, it's four infantry, a drummer, and an officer. The drummer allows you to change formations for one action point instead of two. But he's also got a unit of foot dragoons and a unit of artillery. Now, the foot dragoons are a special case. I only have the figures for using them as infantry, so on the tabletop battle, you'll only ever see them on foot. But they can move at the speed of cavalry on the map. That may come into play later. I'm a little surprised he didn't put the foot dragoons with uh, detachment blue, because they can move at the same speed. Oh, one other thing. I don't know if I mentioned. If you're moving by road the entire turn, you get one extra box. So your mounted boys can move four squares 
where your foot guys can only move three. That's about it for the unit. So now we need to go ahead. That's the game, right? You've got three detachments of French coming in from the north, three British coming from the south. By the way, I told the French player you only that the British only have two units. The British actually have three. Surprised me? Probably going to surprise him as well. But that's how the fog of war operates. See how we're being tricksy hobbits? And at this point, before we go on to pushing our units around the map, there's one last thing I want to add. We are about 20 minutes into this video, and we haven't rolled a single die. We haven't moved a single unit. It's all been prep work. It took me several hours to design the map. I made some changes because I thought, no, that's dumb, that's dumb. Move this here, move this. Because bear in mind, oh, yeah, going back to the map, you see this hill? It does. Um, the, the deal is that all of these features, I should say the hills, the buildings, and the trees block line of sight. So you can see, your army can see six squares, unless it's on a hill, unless it's blocked by a tree, in which case they can't see beyond it. Unless he's on a hill, in which case not only can you see over things, you can see 12 squares. So suddenly hills take on a, a big deal. Because if you're on this hill here, you can see all the way over to the road, where before you could barely see to the stream. Hills matter, not just as defensible terrain, but also for scouting. Okay. This is a lot of work to put together, but you turn it over to your friends... And now we're doing some Kriegspiel. Now we're doing, they're having to make the decisions based on incomplete knowledge. They're having to trust their subordinates. And what's more to the point, they're going to have to trust me to be fair and open. The good news is, I'm doing all this live. I, I This was probably filmed anywhere from three to four weeks ago. I'm not going to publish this until we're well into the game. And the spoilers that I reveal, because I have more surprises coming up, it won't affect the game. Hopefully... By the time they see this video, uh, those surprises will have already come out. Okay? Well, I don't know yet. We'll have to see how that goes. But I want you guys to take this and not just enjoy it, but, but put one of these together for two of your buddies. Your online buddies. We're doing all this by email. I sent them a scan of this map, and then they just drew in, like, paint, Photoshop, whatever, Arrows. Oh, lion is doing this. Wait a minute. Lion's British. Lion's doing like whatever. Lion's going this way. Unicorn that way. Wheel is going that way. Oh, he named... I didn't even give him a name for that third detachment with the cannon. He called it wheel, which is great. Cannons have wheels. Oh, mnemonics are the best. Hey, one other thing I didn't consider. What if the British intercept a supply wagon and they win? Do the supplies disappear? Nope. They're going to have to escort them back to their to the to the nearest village. Oh, interesting. More wrinkles. It's very complicated. Very, very hard. But I look, you shouldn't be intimidated by the complexity of this. You see this book right here? This is a book of rules. It's 64 pages. Zoom in there, camera. It's, it's, it's 64 pages of rules. You see how complicated this is? And we don't balk. We don't shy away. We embrace that. Same thing with a campaign like this. We don't balk. We don't shy away. We love complexity. We're smarter than your average pairs. I mean... You know, if we weren't, we'd be playing 5th edition D&D. So, all that out of the way, let's go ahead and take a look at the orders and put some armies down and see where they bump into each other. we got to take this one move at a time. All right, I'm going to use markers because we got a lot of moving parts. Every given day, every given day has 12 map movement turns, each of which is equivalent to two tabletop turns. If a detachment is able to race to the aid of another detachment, we'll have to figure out, oh, well, if they're close enough to each other, say, two squares away, well, it may be that the other detachment can arrive on turn four of the tabletop battle, or turn six, depending on how far away they are. You will, you can always have the option of marching to the sound of the guns. So even if you can't see the guys, if they're engaged, you can hear them. All right, so let's go over real quick. The orders that the French gave were for Detachment Blue. This is our cavalry force. Race on down to, and I'm going to read it. Uh, let me just double check because I want to get this right. That is Lieutenant Colonel Locataire is supposed to 
race down to Tantrum on the green, engaging any enemy that they see. The small unit under Lieutenant Colonel Moore are going to come on at point two. They're going to march straight over to uh, the Orange Chicken Bridge. Seize that. The large force that includes the cannon is going to march overland very slowly to Beasley Farm. All righty, that sounds good. And then they're going to secure the supplies before moving on to Young Crossing. Bear in mind, the cannon only moves one square per turn over land, so that's going to be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven turns before they get there. Turn eight will be procuring the supplies. He may wind up squatting there overnight while his boys deliver the goods off off table. We'll worry about that on turn eight. We haven't even got through turn one. Force Lion on the part of the British have been ordered to march to Beckerville, engaging any enemies that they encounter. So I don't know where they're going to encounter. Interestingly, the orders here are the horses are to make all due haste. Well, they're not going to leave the site of their protective infantry. So I'm going to let them get a couple of squares ahead. They can see a couple of squares ahead. They'll have a little bit of time to react as these as this cavalry engages them, because that's going to be, it looks like, the first engagement. That's what it looks like. Oh, is that a setup? Wait for the reveal. Detachment wheel here, to refresh your memory, is the larger attachment. It's got the cannon with it. It's going to be able to move two squares. Bum, 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 bum. So it's going to take two turns just to get to Tantrum on the green. They have been ordered to follow Lion and then move over and secure Orange Chicken Bridge. That's going to take one, two, three, four, five six, seven turns. So they're probably going to get there about the same time as this detachment. We may see a battle for the bridge here as well. And that may take so long that whoever wins this battle can ride to reinforce. I don't know. We'll have to see. Something surprising might happen. Detachment Unicorn has been tasked to patrol down to Hethwill Farm, engage the first enemy you see. So they may get to about here and then go, oh, look, there's something going on at Beasley Farm, and then march over land to there. All right. But we gotta we gotta do the math, right? So the first thing that happens is, I, I think we can. These guys are far enough away. They're gonna be moving at three squares per turn. They have infantry with the bonus road move. They're gonna be able to one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So we're just gonna put them right here. They've already moved up through turn three. Likewise with this detachment, bang, bang, bang. The detachment Blanc at the end of turn three is gonna be right there. And I'm just gonna leave the piece next to him. It's a little too big, as you can see. Adjust my camera so the map isn't flipping around all over the place. There we go. These guys in the first three turns, they're going to be able to go one, two, three, four, five, six. So they're going to make it to Yojimbo Farm on turn three. I might have given them a little bonus movement. It's all right. They're very eager. Now we got to deal with these guys on turn one, two, three. They can go one, two, three. They're going to be just basically north of Tantrum on the Green with that cannon. And then w these guys in three turns are going to go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. They're going to be up here at the bridge. Cavalry screen out front. They can kind of see this direction a little bit, but, you know, they're blocked by the road and this line of woods. So they can kind of see the beckaville Hopeton Road. Now we get to the fun bit, where the cavalry can move four squares per turn. As soon as they appear, they see a lot of commotion in Beckerville. What the French didn't realize is that there is a troop of guerrillas in that village who immediately... Now, the guerrillas' orders are... Um, and I, I want to I check my notes here and make sure I get it right. They will delay any column heading toward Beckerville. If the force is too large, retreat over the ford to Yojimbo Farm. Oh. So, is the force too large? I've got 18 foot guys defending a village against 12 horses. Is that too large? I think so. I doubt that a number of irregulars, it might only be 12, I, I have to double check. Uh, my notes, I'm not going to do that. They are going to retreat. Uh, we are not capable of fighting Lancers and Hussars both. One, two, three. And what that means is that these guys with their four moves, they don't know what's going on just yet. They saw some commotion. They saw a unit. Then on turn number two, remember the rest of these guys are on turn three. On turn number two, they're going to pull off the road and hide in these woods as the horses come out. One, two. The question is going to be, 
Do they catch sight? Do they realize what's going on? And I think the answer is yes. This cavalry is going to see a small unit of armed men, and it's going to ride them down, breaking them up, fighting them piecemeal. So our first battle is actually going to be this small little skirmish that features all of the horses against all of our partisans. When, how are the forces going to come on? Well, I think these guys have run to the woods trying to avoid being seen by the cavalry, and they failed. So in our battle, what we're going to do is have, and this battle will ha start on, let's call it the second half of turn number two. So these guys are going to be too far away to do any good. The question is whether these guys, they're going to be right here. So we'll move these out of the way. So on turn two, they'll be here. On turn three, they'll be at Yojimbo Farm. So it's going to take them one two turns to get there which is gonna be well actually they gotta come up this way don't they so one two three four so they'll appear on the battlefield if they're going to well what are their orders that's the other question right force under Moore has been ordered to because even if they hear the sound of the guns they may say not my job uh, seize, what is their secondary effort? Le Moore has been ordered to seize Orange Chicken Bridge. From which direction? So, yeah, they may not, actually. They may say, okay, good, you guys got it. We're just going to keep on heading north. One, two, so they're one, two, three, four, five, six. They're going to get there on turn six as well. So here's what we're going to do. We'll see. I have to figure out how long this battle takes. The table is going to look a little something like this. Right here. And then we'll see how long that fight takes. And we'll have to come back and see where these forces wind up and how much further these guys have moved. Because by turn three of the tabletop game... All of these guys will have caught up. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to put down Unicorn. I'm going to put down Wheels. I'm going to put down Lion. They will have successfully crossed the bridge. And that's where our British wind up. At the end of turn three, here is our Blanc. Here is our Rouge. And then we're at this battle... So this is at the end of three. We're going to put... So what we do to manage this campaign, we're going to freeze the rest of the world. We've already determined he's not going to come riding to the aid. He is going to obey his objectives to return to move up to Orange Chicken Bridge. They are going to move to Beasley Farm. These guys haven't sighted any enemy yet. And then, of course, Lion is going to swing around this way. How many turns away are they? One, two, three, four, five, six. So it's one, two, three. They're there. One, two, three. It's one turn. Then turn at the end of turn two. One, two, three. Turn four. Turn five. So they may show up on turn six, but they're too far away to see. One, two, three, four, five, six. So yeah, uh, the best they could do is hope to turn up on turn six. We're just not going to do that. We're going to freeze the world, fight this battle. And then we'll see what we need to do to bring these guys to catch up to the folks that are on the battle. If these, this battle takes like five turns, uh, let me put it this way. The guerrillas are trying to slow down these cavalry. So they're going to hold out as long as they can. If it takes ten turns on the tabletop, that means this cavalry is going to be stuck in this area until nightfall. That's their goal. Hold out for 10 turns. No, that's not Nightfall, is it? 10 turns on the tabletop. It's five turns in the game. That'll be turn eight. So then we'll figure out where these guys are on turn eight, and they may show up immediately afterwards. But that's a question for after we fight the French Detachment Blue trying to scare off this detachment of guerrillas. Tune in for that battle, which will be fought using Chosen Men. Until then... Let there be light. I'm praying for you.